Well, good morning. Oh, I, I heard you guys singing out highest praises, Lord of all. You're more awake than that. Good morning. All right. It's good to be with you. If I haven't had the privilege to meet you before, my name is Jonathan, and I'm really excited to be able to share to you, uh, share with you today from God's Word. We're specifically going to be talking about conversations with others and specifically honing in on how do we have faith-oriented conversations well? How do we do this really well in our hearts and in our lives? And I think many of us come in with a, a whole variety of experiences or fears or, or all sorts of things. And so we're just going to have a dialogue and a conversation around that today. Um, I want to start this morning actually by showing you guys some research. If you'll allow me to just get my nerd on for a second here. You know, nerds rule the world now. Look at Bill Gates. He's doing okay. Okay, here's, here's what the uh, Barna Research Group says. They, they looked at people in all different age brackets from millennials uh, to Gen X to uh, elders and boomers. Like he looked at all the different age ranges and they, uh, they said, um, this is what they found, that 95% to 97% of U.S. Christians believe that part of their faith means being a witness for Jesus. So pretty much everybody believes that. Depending on your age, somewhere between 94 and 97% of American Christians say that the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to know Jesus. So basically, every Christian, regardless of your age range, is saying that Part of our call as Christians is to be a witness and that the best thing, I mean, that's a significant statement. The best, the very best thing that could happen to somebody is that they would come to know Jesus in somewhere between 94 and 97 percent of Christians are saying that is true. So pretty much everybody is saying that's true. But there's this real tension for us in the sense of we think it's the best thing, but how often are we having faith-oriented conversations? I want to show you some other research that Barna has. And before I explain what's, what's going on here, I want you to understand that this is self-identified Christians saying how many faith-oriented conversations they have had in the last 12 months. So that's not just like evangelism conversations, me sharing my faith. It, it would be um, talking to my spouse or my kids or my friends or my whoever, talking something about faith. So let me break, down, break this down to you. Um, between these two numbers, the, the red ones here, about a quarter of respondents, are what Barna labeled as eager conversationalists. That means that 10 uh, that means that 25% are having 10 or more faith-oriented conversations in their year. And I think that's worth commending. But if you look at all these blue numbers, which is about 75%, that's what Barna has labeled as reluctant conversationalists. That means 75% of us as Christians are having nine or fewer faith conversations in a year. What you can see here is about a third of us are having one or two faith conversations that, that respondents could remember, and a full 9%, what you might call a tithe of the church, is having zero faith conversations that they could remember in the last 12 months. So we've got this situation where we say, pretty much every Christian is saying the very best thing that could ever happen to somebody is that they would know Jesus, and then the reality that we're not talking about it. And so there's this real tension inside of us. And I, and I think there's a lot of reasons. And a, a couple I think of is that um, maybe it's that for us that, that we don't share our faith. It, it might be that we just feel like we don't know how. And I've got some good news for you. Next week, Pastor Bob is actually going to be sharing some specific ways that you can share your story and God's story. Um, and it's going to be a real practical teaching. So I'd encourage you to come back next week if you're in that category where you feel like you don't know how or you'd like to be better equipped. Or maybe you fall into a category where you'd like to, but you don't feel like you see any opportunities and you don't want to force something that isn't there. Or maybe it's that I, I don't want to develop relationships with people who don't follow Jesus because I'm fearful of them and maybe what they would pull me into. And so I always keep my distance from those people over there. Or maybe it's that, honestly, this, isn't, this just isn't a priority in our lives. There's so much else going on. 
And the final, the final reason could be that, and I think a lot of us might fall into this category, is that we could just be concerned we're going to mess it up. Like if we start that faith conversation, it's, it's going to feel like, oh, what if they feel like judged by me, like I'm holier than them? Or, and we don't, we don't want to become those judgmental, intolerant Christians. And so as a result, we end up just staying silent. We just don't talk because we're, we're nervous about it. So we've got this real tension between what we think is the best thing that could ever happen to somebody and how this is actually playing out in our lives. But I've got good news for you today. God's word has hope and instruction for us. How many of you are with me and are excited to learn from God's word? Amen. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with us here this morning, that you would show us, that you would inspire our hearts to become more like you, to be activated by your mission. And all who agree with that prayer said amen. 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 So we are going to open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. It'll be on the screen here for you in a minute. And uh, what I want you to understand is that this is actually a, uh, the middle of a sermon that Peter is giving at Pentecost. And uh, I would encourage you this week to read Acts 1 and 2 because there's just all these like amazing things that are happening. And we're going to break down a component of what is happening there today. We pick up in verse 37. Peter's in the middle of giving a a sermon, and there's like thousands of people there listening to give you an idea of how this is all unfolding. This is in the middle of his sermon we pick up. It says this, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people saying yes to Jesus. Holy smokes. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So verse number 37, I want to back up to this. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And I never really thought about this or noticed this before, but in the middle of Peter giving this message to 3,000 people, he ends up fielding a question. And i got to be honest, I'm not up here trying to field questions today. So, um, like, And there's reasons why we don't, you know, in the middle of a sermon, like have everybody shouting out different questions. It would take forever and, you know, all of that. We know why we don't do that. But he is in the midst of this, and they are actually having a dialogue. He's having a, a conversation with people with the questions that they have about God and to understand about forgiveness and to understand this thing he's talking about, the Holy Spirit, and trying to understand at all the miraculous things happening around them. And here's here's what's really interesting, and I think what's important for us to remember is that it started for them with a relationship, and everything for us begins with a relationship. Everything for us begins with a relationship. And I think sometimes for us as Christians, we can get, when it it comes to faith-oriented conversations, we can get super nervous. We start perspirating and we start like shaking. We get like really, really nervous. And, And part of that is from a good place. Like we understand, like this is a really important conversation. But I've got some freeing news, or I hope what's freeing news for you today, is that the gospel, when you are sharing it, it's a conversation, not a presentation. Like, it, it's a dialogue. It's a two-way thing. It's, it's not a monologue. It's, it's clear. Peter is clear here. He's compelling. He's giving reasons for the hope that lies within him. But at the same time, he leaves space for questions. And he's having a conversation, even with 3,000 people. I think that is really impressive. And I think part of a relationship always involves listening. Like, it can't just be you talking one direction. I don't know about you, but if you've ever fought with your spouse 
and you are trying to win the argument, you're, you're thinking about what you want to say so that you can try to get your way and win the argument. This has never happened in the Sigmund household, um, but I hear from other people that this happens. Um, and so, but no, we know that part of healthy dialogue means you have to be listening. Like, it, it's a foundation for every healthy relationship. And so in faith conversations, if we're unable to listen, we will never be heard. Like, we've, we've got to start with a place of listening. We've got to start there. Because if, if we're going to have these faith conversations, which I believe that God's word is inviting us to today, we can't just come in with our own preset agenda of exactly what I want to say and, and how I want to say it. Our conversation has to involve two-way conversation in listening. The other thing I think that is a component of a healthy relationship, in addition to listening, is that it has to have love and, and respect, mutual love and respect for one another for a healthy relationship to thrive. It's got to be founded in love. And so when we're talking about faith, it's got to be founded in that first. There was this one time several years ago where Pastor Bob and I were in um, kind of like a counseling-oriented conversation. He and I were, were trying to help somebody here in the church and um, we, we left that conversation, and I was processing with him after, and I said, you know, hey, how did you come up with that, like, really good insight for that person? I was trying to learn, trying to grow. And he said something to me that just stuck with me, and I, that I'll never forget. He said, you know, when I came into the conversation, even though there was conflict that existed, I started from a place where I was for that person. I was for them. And... I think that that is so important for us because we've all been in situations where we felt like somebody didn't love us. They, it didn't at least feel like they were for us. And being for someone doesn't mean that you have to agree with absolutely every decision that they are making. Like, I haven't met the person yet that I agree with every decision they're making, including my own inconsistent self, <laughs> okay? So being for somebody just simply means you want what is best for them. And people can tell. People can tell if you are for them or if you are against them. And we are a church that is for people. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we still haven't answered this question, though. How do we know today? How do we know when to speak and when to share our faith? And when do we actually stay silent? Because there's a real tension there that exists that I think we've, we've got to explore. Well, here's what it says in verse 42. They, meaning the apostles, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I want to break this passage down to you. Just, just look at this. You know, this is basically how we try to model what we're doing here at church. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the preaching and teaching of God's word. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we do on Sunday mornings. And to fellowship. Like, that's why we have things like life groups or Bible studies. Like, this is why we get together and we're invested in each other's lives. And to the breaking of bread. And here at Calvary, we don't just break regular old bread. We got to put glaze and sugar all over it. Like, that's how we break bread up in here. And I know you had a donut on the way in, and I know you're hoping I wrap up soon so you can get that second donut. And it's a no-judgment zone, so you do you, okay? But... Okay, so it's to the breaking of bread, and they devoted themselves to prayer. And, you know, we're talking about this situation where there's a revival that happens. 3,000 people in one conversation say yes to Jesus. Like, man, I don't know about you, but I want to experience something like that in my life. Like, that would be amazing. And Peter gets to experience this. But before he gets to this point in Acts chapter 2 where we've read, we've got to look back at what, what they did before that to kind of pave the way. So in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, it says that Jesus instructed the disciples they wanted to move, but he said, you need to wait. You need to stay here and be patient. And then it moves to Acts 1, verse 8, and Jesus says to them, you will be my witnesses throughout the whole earth. Like, it's going to start here in Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the whole ends of the earth. Like, that includes us. Praise the Lord. And it says you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're waiting. They're understanding they've got the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And then here's what it says in Acts 1.14. We cannot miss this. It says this, they all joined constantly together in prayer constantly together in prayer. These people were getting together and they were focused on Jesus. They were praying fervently that a move of God would happen in their friends and in their city's lives. They were so focused on that. They, they did this fervently together all the time. Like this is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, pray without ceasing. It, it's, it's going after God and staying focused on him, and specifically pleading for those in our lives who do not yet know the goodness of who God is. Like, can you imagine walking every day in this world and not understanding who your creator is and how much you are loved and trying to find that in so many other places? We've got the hope of the world living inside of us. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. And so we've got this opportunity. And man, here, I think that in Acts chapter 1, it gives us this great model, this great way to show us. They, these disciples, they get together, they wait, and then they pray, and then they invite. And can I be honest with you here for a minute? There have been times for myself where, you know, even as a pastor, where I, I view myself as like a literal missionary to Chai Lai, where there have been times in my life where I have not been fervently praying for the people in my life who don't know Jesus. Like I just got distracted with all the other things, all the responsibilities, all the work, all the whatever, that that has drifted in my life. And honestly, it's pretty embarrassing to admit to you, um, so please don't judge me. But, but honestly, I, I've been in this spot, and you know, upon self-reflection, I didn't notice it at the time, but in reflection, what I realized is that in those times where I was not specifically trying to pray for people in my life who didn't know Jesus, I started to feel less connected to God. And I don't think God was moving away from me. I think I wasn't spending time with him. And I started to feel less like my work had purpose, less like I was living on mission. My, my apathy started to grow. Even, I would say, my temptations started to grow. But I would say the opposite is also true as well. When I really felt like, when I feel like I am fervently praying and focused on the mission that God has given to each and every one of us, not just pastors, each and every one of us, the priesthood of all believers, when I feel like I am living on mission, I do feel more connected to God. I do feel more like I'm living on purpose and on mission and that these days aren't meaningless. And I think this is what the Lord is inviting us to today, to pray for opportunities, to pray for opportunities for our friends, to be able to share our faith. So it starts with relationship. Everything starts with a relationship. And then we move into a place we are, where we are praying for opportunities. But we still really haven't wrestled down this question of how do I know when to share and how do I know when to zip it <laughs> and just shut my mouth and let things be. It's a real tension. Check this out. In, uh, we'll skip ahead to verse number 38. It says this. And at the end of here it says, And you will receive the gift of... Of the Holy Spirit. You see, I can't answer every question about every scenario that you're gonna face this week and in your life about whether or not uh, you should speak or what you should say or how you should say it or any of those things. I can't answer that, but there is someone who can, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And, and here's the thing, the, the Holy Spirit is not just this like outside, weird, universal force. Like, this is a very person of who God is. And the Holy Spirit is, is like our compass. He helps give us direction. He helps show us. He helps, he helps answer the question, when do I speak? When do I not share something? And he can even equip us to be able to do the work that God has called us to do. And here's the thing I know, is that the Holy Spirit helps us know exactly when to know, when to seize the opportunity and to do it with courage. Because I don't know about you, but there are times where I don't feel courageous as a Christian. There's times where I do feel kind of timid or like, I don't, I don't really know. Like, I don't know all the answers. I don't have it all together. Like, I got my own junk. So how could I be sharing with somebody else their stuff? Well, listen to this in 2 Timothy 1.7. 
when, it's, when we're asking the question, what does the power of the Holy Spirit allow for us? For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid. Instead, it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I don't know about you, but I want to be a kind of believer who's operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody who is constantly living in love and somebody who has self-discipline. And the way that I do that in my heart and in my life is I press in to the Holy Spirit. See, church, we don't have to live timid, scared lives like Everybody is going to make me fall off the deep end on my faith if I have a conversation and we disagree. No, we have the power of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of us. Amen? Amen. I remember a few summers ago, I was uh, working at a school. And I uh, had a really good experience, and I had a co-worker there, and we developed a really good friendship there. He's a really solid dude. We had just some really fun times and uh, just developed a really good friendship. But he would be somebody who would uh, self-proclaim, like, I don't follow God. I don't believe in that. Um, uh, he's an intellectual, and um, that, that's, just, that's just not where he's at. And so throughout the summer, you know, we had lunches together and um, several conversations, shared an office. And, you know, so, so we had a lot of different dialogues. And, and sometimes there would be some earnest questions. Sometimes there would be some questions uh, or comments that were kind of even condescending. And, but I honestly, I, I really enjoyed him as a friend. So the, the summer came to an end and, and to a close. And so um, we, we, I, I wasn't working there anymore. So we stopped seeing each other quite as regularly. And he had come to visit our church a couple of times. He came and heard me speak, which I felt really honored that he would take time to be able to do that. But, but our relationship kind of faded over time as we uh, just weren't seeing each other on a regular basis. But one day out of the blue, he gave me a call and I, and I see his name pop up and my phone's ringing. And he sounds like he's in, in kind of like a panicked mode. And basically, he starts sharing some of what's going on in his heart and in his life. And he shared with me, he said, you know, honestly, Jonathan, I, I'm in this spot where either I'm going to have a mental breakdown or I'm going to find God. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to choose the latter <laughs> there. So, so we got together, we got some coffee, and we started having a dialogue. And honestly, for the first hour, I just listened and I tried to just be there for my friend. And I didn't, I didn't have any like great, amazing words of wisdom or anything. I just tried to listen. I tried to love my friend. And by the end, he just straight up asked me. He said, what do you think of all of this? Like, what do I do? And I really felt like it was a door that the Holy Spirit was opening in that moment. Something that I had been praying for for the last two years. I had been praying. Anytime I drove past his school, I would pray for him. Or anytime I would scroll past his name on social media, I would pray for him. Those were my two cues to remember to pray for him. And now I feel like there's this opportunity in front of me. And part of his question that he was really wrestling with is he said, like, I've done all these things, but, like, I feel basically empty inside. And that was where I really felt like, you know what? Jesus can give you hope. And so I started sharing that with him. Like, if you keep trying to fill this up with, with girls and money and even your good works that you're doing, it, it's never going to be enough. Like, it's never going to fully satisfy you. But if you come to know that your creator loves you, that he sent his son to die for you, you could be forgiven of your sins even if right now you can't forgive yourself. And so we just had this dialogue. And honestly, there wasn't this, like, come to Jesus moment right there. I was hoping and praying for it, and it didn't happen. But here is, here is the thing. I don't believe that God is done. And I believe right now I'm in the patience. I'm in the waiting. I'm in the, I'm in the relationship and the prayer phase. But you know what? I'm believing that one day the Holy Spirit's going to give another opportunity, whether to me or to somebody else, that these seeds that were planted are going to flourish, and he's going to come to know just how good and gracious Jesus really is. Amen? And here's the thing. This is how it works for us. It starts with relationships, with our friends, with our family. And then it moves into this place of fervent prayer. And we cannot miss that. I think so many of us 
just are waiting for an opportunity to come out of the blue, and we're not pressing into the Lord. And so I think one of the challenges for us today is to think, how could I become a person who prioritized time with the Lord to specifically pray for my friends who don't know Jesus? Maybe that's your challenge today. And the last one is to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, you don't have to have confidence in your own self, with your own mind, with your own morality, with your own, any preparation you have. You can walk in confidence because of what Jesus has done for you. And here's what Jesus said. This is, this is an unbelievable thing he says right before he leaves. He says, it is better for you that I would go and leave to you my spirit. Because then everywhere that you go, you can be empowered by him. Man, if that doesn't give us hope and that doesn't give us confidence and that doesn't raise us up as a church, I don't know what will. But you know what? I'm encouraged by us as a church. Because I don't think we're just falling into some statistics of being, we're never going to talk about faith. No, we're going to lean in as a church to the opportunities that God has for us. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to invite you to bow your heads for a moment of reflection here. There's something else I want us to think about this morning. And that is that for Peter, in the midst of this story, before he has this great revival, you got to back it up a couple chapters in the Bible and understand that just before this moment, Peter denies Jesus three times. Not once, not twice, three times. His best friend. He says, I don't know that man. And this is the same Peter who not long after God chooses to use in a miraculous way for many people to come to faith in Christ. This, this broken man. And maybe for you, you feel like you don't have it all together. You don't have all the answers. You're even messed up. You've got sin in your own heart and life. So who are you to share? You see, the same thing that was true for Peter is also true for us. It's not about how good we are. It's that we are made clean by the blood of the Lamb. And that now we get to live spirit-empowered lives. And I don't know why God has chosen to do it this way, where he has said, you, followers of me, will be my message carriers to share the hope of the world. But God has chosen to do that. And so we have this amazing opportunity to be able to share God's love in our world. And I think most of us here today aren't in the side of the camp where um, we're just like forcing conversations all the time that aren't there. That's probably not where most of us are. Where probably most of us are is that we're not in the space where we are fervently praying, just like I admitted as well. And I think the Lord is calling us today to pray fervently and to, and to be empowered by the Spirit. And so I want to give you a moment as your action step today to think about and to actually talk to the Lord about anyone in your heart in life that you would love to come see, know how good he is. And I'm just going to give you a minute quietly in your own heart and in your own mind to pray for that person or persons. So, Lord, this morning, we lift up these names to you. They are souls that long to be known by their creator. And so, Lord, I pray you would give us opportunities. You would know when it is time to speak and when it is time to listen. And that when the opportunity comes, that we would have the courage, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to step into those conversations to do so boldly and confidently, not because of who we think we are, but because of who we know you are and have equipped us to be. And all who agree with that prayer said amen.
Amen. Would you stand and join with me? We're going to sing in song together God's story. He is our hope, our living hope. Let's raise our voices.